Murphy. And just days after the murder, her unusual request and phone call to police. And, and you said because he was getting a shower, that's when you woke up? Okay. So, and then when did you see him uh, after that? Did you have breakfast with him? You know, I mean, what happened after I that? I didn't get out of bed. Oh, you just kind of woke up and you were alert right. in bed. Yeah, okay. and we have, our, we, our, our bedroom is an attic was an attic and so the bathroom's right here and so okay. you know he got dressed and left. Prosecutors saying that the struggling writer had 1.5 million reasons to murder her husband because that's how much she stood to inherit. As prosecutors played this shocking recording, members of the jury put down their notebooks, leaned in, and looked at Nancy. My insurance company said, well, just have the detective write a letter that you're no longer a suspect. And I said, man, I just don't know that he's there. Uh, and I'm not sure that he looks at that way. But if you do, I get you to write the letter. My sister, when I told her this as a lawyer, laughed so hard she fell out of the chair. So. Meanwhile, defense attorneys are focusing on how much Nancy loved her husband. He was first her instructor, then husband. Nancy's medical problems sparked a need for her to take care of him if she died, which is why she had so many life insurance policies in the first place. Nancy was lost after Dan was killed. Her friends will tell you that she sounded very confused. It was, a, it was as though the earth had fallen away from her feet. Nancy was overwhelmed. A friend says Nancy was very un-Nancy. After Dan died, she appeared totally blank. Coming up, testimony will continue with prosecutors building more of a case and the timeline of events the day that Dan Brophy was killed. We're also expecting to hear from Portland police. In Portland, Oregon, Matt Johnson, Court TV. Joining us now, we have criminal defense attorneys Eric Faddis in Denver and Jesse Lal in Atlanta joining us. Thank you both for being with Good us morning. this morning. Um, you know, so in opening statements, the prosecution, they covered a lot of ground. Uh, one thing that they didn't talk about, though, was that letter, right, that we've discussed extensively here on Court TV. Seven years prior to this incident, um, or that essay, I should say, uh, seven years prior to the incident, uh, the defense defendant had penned that essay about, you know, how to murder your husband. So th the jury apparently is not going to get to hear about that. The judge ruled on that. <sighs> um, but that said, did you feel uh, that the facts laid out so far, Eric, have been compelling enough uh, to get the jury kind of set on the right tone? You know, Joy, I'm not quite there yet. Let, let's see how this trial plays out. There's still a lot to go. Uh, the prosecution is going to disclose everything that they think is compelling in terms of evidence against this defendant. Uh, but when we look at it, I mean, you know, the prosecution is harping on this motive regarding life insurance and that the uh, defendant made claims to the life insurance policy after her husband had died. Uh, but isn't that what we would expect anyone to do whose husband died, even if they didn't kill that person? Um, and so that's not overly incriminating to me uh, and, and especially with that bombshell ruling that the how to kill your husband letter is not coming into evidence I think that substantially weakens the prosecution's case it seems overly circumstantial uh, but let's see how it plays out so Jesse is some really interesting details that uh, we've also uncovered about about this case apparently Nancy Brophy had sold it insurance herself, life insurance, and she was mm -hmm. the sole beneficiary of all six uh, policies, life insurance policies, and his workers' comp policy as well. Some other interesting things I found, um, the Brophies were $6,000 behind in their house payments, and that same year spent 16000 in life insurance payments. I mean, when you look at that, uh, that seems, uh, you know, pretty compelling. I don't know. Do you, do you agree? It's not compelling. Uh, what you have is evidence that the state has to try somehow get it to the jury because that's all they have. They have the minivan in the area. They have no idea who was driving that minivan. And they have a romance novelist who wrote about killing her husband seven or 11 years ago. Yes, the sale and the buying of the insurance, that is going to be evidence to shed to a possible motive that people are in debt and therefore they buy insurance and they therefore have this conspiracy to kill off their partner. In that case, every spouse in America, be very careful, do not buy insurance because mm. you're gonna be a suspect. So, um, you know, it, it's gonna be a tough, tough sell to this jury. 
Yeah, well, I, I can certainly see your point there. And the defense has really pointed out, well, they don't have a weapon. They don't have a murder weapon mm -hmm. here. Um, so that could seriously be a problem. Some really compelling testimony, of course, that's arguable, right, for the state as well. Yesterday, we heard from an OCI instructor who uh, apparently worked with the victim here and uh, was there the day that he died. Let's go ahead and listen to a, a clip of Dorothy Damon. I am... Um... I went to Dan and I knelt down beside him um, and I didn't know what to do so uh, I held his hand. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to see if he would squeeze it back and he didn't so um, I knew that I had to um, notify my boss and I needed, I needed backup so uh, I went out of the kitchen. Uh, I went out of the kitchen so that I could call um, my bosses and I don't remember uh, much of the conversation. Um, he, um, he tried to help me as best he could, but he really just said, okay, I'm on my way in. And, um, and then I hung up the phone and I, I'm pretty sure I was just, wailing. Yeah, so Dorothy Damon, uh, you know, worked with Dan at the Oregon Culinary Institute where he was a, a chef as well. But Eric, I mean, despite the emotion that we're hearing there, what does that do to move the state's case forward? Well, you know, when uh, the case lacks substance, maybe try to pull on the heartstrings a little bit. And maybe that's what the prosecution is doing. Uh, I mean, it was certainly uh, evocative testimony, right? You have this person who comes upon a dead body of a, a, you know, an individual she knows and has warm feelings for, and oh, it's terribly sad. It absolutely is, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to minimize. But, but in terms of the evidentiary value, in terms of uh, how that testimony allows the prosecution to meet the elements of a murder charge, uh, I just think it, it, it falls short. That being said, it certainly sets the scene and is the right approach for such a circumstantial case. So I get why they did it. Jesse, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, you've got to set the tone for this trial and you've got to show the tragedy and the devastation and the loss. And this poor woman has come upon a victim, a gunshot victim. I mean, I would be traumatized even years later if I if I came upon a scene like that, no matter how many autopsy pictures I've seen. But, you know, it, it hits you and they set the right tone. And like I said, they're going to be scraping the barrel to find evidence to meet these elements. But, you know, I wish the prosecution all the best. Yeah, well, the prosecution also called uh, Kathleen Dooley to the stand, who actually found Dan Brophy's body and called 911. Um, certainly some emotion there. Let's, let's listen to that. Do you remember there being an encampment or some encampments in the um, area? Sure. I remember there being people that are camped out underneath there, yes. Okay, and th these are people who are, are unhoused, who are living in tents. That would be my assumption. All right. Did you have any interaction with any of them? No. Do you remember an occasion where one walked into the school? No. Do you remember um, an occasion where one asked you about some headphones? In, you are jogging some memory <laughs> that I have well, not just, thought about. Yeah. Just tell us as best you can what you remember about that. I remember there's t there being talk about somebody asking about headphones. Um, I remember there being people who walked through the parking lot of the parking lot that I parked in um, often. Yeah, so, uh, you know, listening to that particular part uh, of her testimony it was about, uh, obviously, this homeless encampment. And, uh, Eric, uh, do you think that this really kind of opens the door for the defense to argue that, uh, you know, hey, someone else may have done this? Oh, totally. But part of a defense counsel's duty in, in a criminal case is to explore plausible alternatives and, 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 and really vet out whether those alternatives could be viable and could explain what happened. And, and, and that's what uh, this 
uh, colloquy absolutely allows for. So defense, if that wasn't defense counsel, defense counsel's gonna get up there and really suggest to this jury that, hey, there are a bunch of unhoused folks around here who uh, were not shy about interacting with people at this Culinary Institute, may have even gone into the Culinary Institute, and perhaps we need to be looking at those folks too in deciding who did this, especially when we have no eyewitnesses as to the murder, no murder weapon found on the defendant. Um, it, it really kind of opens the door to uh, these other plausible explanations. All right, Eric Faddis and Jesse Lal joining us with analysis. Thank you so much. And coming up, we are keeping watch in a New Jersey courtroom as well as the defense for a former Olympic equestrian is set to wrap up their case today. The last witness for the defense is expected on the stand this morning. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Call now. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nacron in for Ted Rollins this morning. We're in day number seven now of the trial of New Jersey versus Michael Barrison. The former Olympic equestrian is accused of shooting his student, Lauren Kennerick, who also lived on the upscale horse farm as his tenant. Barrison's defense team claims Kennerick and her boyfriend, Robert Goodwin, had been mentally torturing the defendant, causing him to suffer temporary insanity. They also say Barrison was acting in self-defense, pointing to injuries he sustained from a dog bite. On the stand right now is what could be the last remaining witness for the defense. The jury is hearing from prison psychiatrist, Dr. John Bascar. Let's go back live into court. He just said that his, he had been very nervous, you know, his mind was racing, that was what I was, yes. Did you note in your report uh, that he was acting apparently impulsively with his recent violent behavior? Well, this, that's also based on the report, just uh, of what he told me, what happened. Okay. Right, so, so you wrote that based on what he told you? Yes, yes. You, you indicated that he had apparently acted impulsively and violently. Oh, did I put that in my note? Yes, yeah, yes. Where it says diagnosis, yeah. what does that uh, mean where it says rule out amnesia due to head trauma? Uh, no, it's just uh, because one of, of the two complaints, one was anxiety, the other one was forgetfulness. So I, I just, uh, just uh, you know, a possible explanation of uh, what he's saying. No further questions, Judge. Okay. Any new direction, Mr. Martin? No, Judge. Fine. You may step down. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Watch your step. Members of the jury, did anyone have trouble hearing any of that testimony? What, was it the entire testimony or just parts of it? No. The very last. Uh, yeah, he, very soft spoken. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to bring him back and have uh, repeated, Mr. Shellhorn? The jurors indicated that in here are the last couple of questions he answers. Judge, I would certainly defer to the jury if they want him to come back. Otherwise, I think the they could certainly ask for that to be replayed if there's any question during the course of their deliberations. Unless they want him to yeah. come back, I would certainly. We can have him come back now that he's here, or everything's recorded. So if you need to hear it, we can have it replayed during your deliberations. I, I leave it up to you. How, how would you like to proceed? I'm happy waiting if it becomes material later. Okay. It is, uh, all the testimonies recorded, you've heard me say that a number of times. So, and if, if you need any specifics of testimony during deliberations, you can always ask for a playback. And we'll have it played back. Okay? All right. We can leave, Judge? Yes. You're fine. You're, you're good to go. 
All right, Mr. Belinkis, your next witness. Corporal Thomas Fellini. Corporal Thomas Fellini. Hi, Corporal. Good morning. Hi. Uh, Good morning. Please place your left hand on the Bible. Raise your right hand. My court clerk will administer an oath. Do you swear in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony of this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name as by your last name for the record. Thomas Fellini. Last name is Kathleen Frank, A L L E N I. Thank you. Corporal, have a seat. Just keep your voice up nice and loud. We have jurors in the first two rows that need to hear. That microphone doesn't project your voice, it just records it, so okay. they need to hear your natural speaking voice. All right, yes, Mr. Boyd, please call it. Thank you. Uh, where are you employed, sir? Washington Township Police Department. And how long have you been employed by them? Uh, 20 years. Directing your attention to uh, uh, August 7, 2019, uh, were you the affiant of a search warrant concerning this case? Yes, I was. Can you, can you explain to the jury what an affiant is? An affiant is um, an officer who collects all the information from the incident that occurred responds to the prosecutor's office, fills out an affidavit stating what uh, what is required to investigate the incident, and we draw up uh, an affidavit of warrant, and a judge reviews that, signs that, and that enables us to collect the evidence we need to do our investigation. Now, in this particular case, you, you were conferring and consulting with the Morris County Prosecutor's Office, correct? Correct. And and after that consult, um, you swore to and submitted your affidavit, correct? Correct. Now, uh, did you request uh, to search any vehicle based on the information that you had had? Yes. Uh, what vehicle and who did it belong to? It was a... Uh can I refer to my Absolutely. I'm going to give you a copy that you will have a more copy given to you from the record. Um, 10 C. Is that a copy of your warrant uh, affidavit? Yes, it is. Uh, what, if any, vehicles uh, do you request to be searched? The, um, the silver Dodge Ram pickup with the Florida registration. And, and, and why did you include that in your affidavit? It belonged to uh, the suspect, uh, Mr. Barrison. And um, uh, were you aware that there were two other vehicles and a trailer parked in the immediate area uh, close to Michael Barrison's vehicle? Yes. Um, did you attempt to get a warrant to search those vehicles? No, we did not. Did you request to search uh, various telephones? Yes. And what telephones were they? There was a black... Samsung Galaxy S7. Who did that belong to, based on your knowledge? Uh, Robert Goodwin. Any others? Uh, yes. There was a white iPhone with a pink case. Belonging to who? Believed to be uh, belong to Lauren Canarac. And then there was a white iPhone with no case. Um, weren't sure who that belonged to. It was in the area of the incident. There was an, uh, another iPhone that was taken from Mary Haskins Gray at police headquarters. Maybe that was all the phones. Did you request the swabbing uh, of, of any person's hand for gunshot residue? Um, yes. Yes. 
And, and whose hands did you request the swab? Um, Michael Barrison. And, and why did you request that Michael Barrison's hands be swabbed for gunshot residue? Due to information at the scene, um, we were advised that he was the shooter. And, 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 and what does gunshot residue have to do with Michael Barrison's hands, if anything? It would uh, prove that he had shot a weapon, shot a gun. Did you ask to swab any other person's hands on that day? No. To your knowledge, was any gunshot residue testing done on anyone in this case? No. I don't believe so. Now, in your affidavit, you put information that you received from various witnesses, correct? Yes. And is it correct that you indicated that Goodwin only heard no objection? All right, so a sidebar underway as uh, what we uh, have gathered is the final witness for the defense uh, before they rest their case in uh, defending Michael Barrison, the former Olympic equestrian on trial for attempted murder. Of course, we're gonna bring you back live into court ahead here on Court TV. Try it free for 30 days. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Limnachran in for Ted Rollins this morning. I want to let you know that coming up tonight on Court TV, the original true crime series, Someone They Knew, with Tamron Hall is on. And tonight she's going to explore the case of an Ohio woman who went to a work party, but then she never made it home. Or did she? Her body was found in the trunk of her own car. Tonight's episode reveals how police reconstructed what happened after the victim left the party and who she ran into along the way. That's tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on Court Court TV. Also, closing arguments could begin as soon as this afternoon in the trial of a former Olympic equestrian, Michael Barrison. The defense is expected to wrap up their case this morning. And remember, Barrison is charged with attempted murder for shooting at his tenants, Lauren Kanarek and Robert Goodwin, on his New Jersey horse farm. Barrison's defense team is claiming that he was mentally tortured by the pair, telling authorities days before the attack, Quote, I'm taking my life back. Let's go back live into court. Uh, there has been a, a law enforcement officer on the stand now being cross-examined by the state. Let's listen. Five for authorization to search any other items relevant to the investigation and crimes described herein that a complete and thorough search will reveal? Yes. So you didn't list every single item, vehicle, location on that 50-acre property in this search warrant affidavit? No, I did not. Just based on what you knew at the time you applied for the search warrant that afternoon, what you were specifically aware of that needed to be searched? Correct. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. What? Can you direct? Yes, Cor Corporal, with regards to this catch-all phrase the prosecutor just uh, brought to your attention. To your knowledge, did you ever search Robert Goodwin's vehicles or his trailer? No. To my knowledge, I, I so did not. Even though technically you could, based on, well, let me see it sideways. All right, so now they're in sidebar once again in court. I want to bring in our guests, once again, criminal defense attorneys Eric Faddis in Denver, Jesse Lal joining us in Atlanta. So as this witness has been on the stand today, uh, this corporal, you know, I've been trying to figure out what was the defense trying to do with him on the stand? Were they kind of trying to paint a picture of shoddy investigative work? Eric, what do you think? Yeah, you know, Joe, I, th I think that's exactly it. That they're, they're just trying to establish that uh, they think this investigation was not complete. The uh, authorities kind of uh, 
came to a conclusion rather quickly and then didn't really investigate any of the other actors involved. And I think that's the point the defense is really trying to get across with these last few law enforcement witnesses. Uh, Corporal Thomas Fellini is the man who we've been seeing on the stand here. Um, you know, Miss Law, uh, Jesse, if you don't mind, how did, you, <laughs> how, how, did, how did you think that the state did in cross-examining and I guess rehabilitating, even though this was a defense witness, rehabilitating mm -hmm. someone who would help their case? You know, if you cannot beat the prosecution case, then the next thing you do is prove shoddy police work. And that's what the defense was trying to do. And um, I think in terms of the state trying to rehabilitate the officer, you know, they did, they did the job that they're supposed to do. Officer, uh, what, did the, what did you want in the warrant? What is included in the warrant? And did this preclude you from examining any other uh, in, uh, items on the property if you feel there was a reason to do so? And it was trying to explain to the jury that this officer did everything according to protocol, according to the book. There wasn't anything shoddy or misplaced or missing on the part of the officer. So um, the, the only little bit thing I would have said is, you know, officer, you knew you were called for this trial, the least he could have done was read the report before he took the stand, you know, be prepared. Don't keep refer ref refreshing your memory. Yeah, and he and he did kind of seem to fumble a little bit. And, and yeah. at, at that moment, I thought, well, I, I can kind of see maybe why the defense called him because it didn't make the investigation <laughs> look, look <laughs> as trustworthy. Um, but I want to also ask you about Dr. John Bascar, who was a, a jail mm. psychiatrist. Um, actually, you know oh. what? The sidebar's over now. So let's go back oh, go ahead. live yeah, into go ahead. court um, where that corporal were, will presumably resume testimony mentioned in a war. What's your understanding? I'm talking about the, 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 the current application. The current no, application. Not, not generally. Right. Just he's, he's asking you about the current search warrant affidavit and the warrant that you received. The warrant that I received. That gave you the authority to search Robert Goodwin's two vehicles and the trailer on the property. Yes. To your knowledge, were they searched? That I could not tell you. Um, did you did you seize the camera that was looking directly at the location? Objection. Where the yeah, Mr. 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 Malik, there's no evidence of this. Just ask a question. Don't let it memorialize, please. Did you put in the affidavit to search things and seize things? Any cameras? Yes. To your knowledge, did they seize any cameras? No. Nothing further. All right, you may step down. Thank you. This is, um... Yes, just leave that now. Council will retrieve it. Just watch your step. <coughs> I'm going to get this. Mm -hmm. Mr. Matthews, there's more there. From the fourth. Those are yours as well. Oh, thank you. Your Honor, the defense calls Jamie Dancer. Jamie Dancer? Can we be heard at sidebar? Sure. All right, so uh, there is another sidebar now underway and the defense preparing to call another witness. We're gonna take a quick break, but we're gonna bring you back live into court for the trial against a former Olympic equestrian accused of attempted murder. That's ahead here on Court TV Live. And 3200 now. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Today could be a pivotal day in the trial for a former Olympic equestrian accused of two counts of attempted murder now. The defense in New Jersey versus Michael Barrison is expected to wrap up their case in chief this morning. Of course, Barrison is accused of shooting at his tenants at an upscale New Jersey horse farm. The prosecution alleges the shooting was an unjustifiable end to a dispute that spiraled out of control. The defense claims, though, that their client suffered temporary insanity and was attempting to defend himself. On the stand right now is Jamie Dancer, who trained at Barrison's horse farm, describes him as a friend and a mentor. Let's go back live into court. 
given your experience with him over those years, did you ever uh, observe him being violent toward a human being? Absolutely not. Were you on the farm in early August 2019? Yes. Were you coming and going in connection with your training? Yes. Uh, during those days, well, are you aware that an incident occurred on August 7th at the farm? Yes. Are you aware that there was a shooting? Yes. Okay. Uh, prior to the shooting is the next series of questions. That's what I'm going to ask about. Okay. okay? Um, were you observing uh, Michael Barrison's uh, behavior at all in the days leading up to the shooting? Yes. Uh, how was he acting in comparison to the Michael that you knew from all of those years before? He was very upset. He was distraught. Um, I was very concerned he was going to harm himself. When you say harm himself, in what way were you concerned that Michael Barrison was going to harm himself? I thought he was going to kill himself. Uh, did his appearance change at all in those days leading up to the incident? Yes. What changed about his physical appearance? He was pacing. He wasn't as, he did, like his shirt wasn't all the way tucked in. Um, no belt. Um, it's like, uh, Sorry, I just need a minute. <laughs> Take as much time as you need. Um, just not him. He wasn't him. He was. It was hard to, to talk to him. I was concerned about him. Was he less communicative than before? Yes. Did he look disheveled in any way, personally, in his appearance? Yes. Then you say pacing. Tell me more about the pacing that you saw. Um. It was like neurotic. It was like neurotic pacing. It, I can only compare it to horses, um, which they pace when they're stressed and, they, and they're looking and they're searching and they're just unsettled. Based upon what you observed with Michael Barristone, did you come to any conclusions as to whether he was stressed? Yes, he was stressed. And did you come to any conclusions in your own mind as to how you felt the degree of stress that Michael was under at that time? Extremely high. Extremely high. As a result of your observations of Michael, or pardon me, let me back up for a second. Did you make any of these observations of Michael the day before the shooting, which would have been August 6, 2019? Yes. And as a result of your observations and what your concerns were, did you take any action? I did. What did you do? I called my good friend, Ali Brock. All right. And I don't want you to talk about what was said on the conversation. Okay. Okay. So you talked to Ali Brock. Yes. Uh, and did you walk away from that conversation with any understanding as to whether Ali Brock was going to take any action? Yes. And what was your understanding that you walked away from that conversation with? Objection. What's the nature of your objection, Mr. Shellhorn? It's hearsay, Judge. Or it calls for a hearsay response. It does. Objection sustained. Uh, questions withdrawn. Had you, uh, based upon your observations on August 6th of 2019, had you ever before in your association with Michael Barrison seen him in such a state? No. I have no further questions of the witness. Very oh, good. Cross examination, Mr. Shawhorn. Uh, Ms. Dancer, you weren't at the farm on August 7, 2019, were you? No. You don't have any personal knowledge of what happened on that day? No. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. All right. No redirect, Your Honor. Right, you may step down, Mr. Dancer. Thank you. Please. You can sit this way. Thank you. Let's watch this step. Your Honor, our next witness I'd like to call is Allison Brock. All right. Allison Brock, please. Allison. Hi, Ms. Brock. Hi. Uh, uh, please remain standing for a moment. Place your left hand on the bottle. Raise your right hand. 
Do you swear in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony that to this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and your last name for the record. Allison Brock, B R O C K. Thank you. All right, you may have a seat, Ms. Brock. We just had a Counsel, direct examination. Good morning, Ms. Brock. Good morning. Um, where do you reside? What state? I'm in Florida. And uh, uh, what town in Florida? Uh, specifically Loxahatchee. Okay. And uh, uh, are you an athlete? I am. In what sport? Uh, in the sport of dressage. And how long have you been a, a dressage athlete? Oh, it's in 25 years, at least. And um, could you give the jury a brief summary of your accomplishments in that sport? Yes. Uh, I was a member of the 2016 Rio Olympic team for dressage for the U.S., and we won a bronze medal. So I've competed internationally at the highest level. Was that Team USA? Yes. Was Michael Barristan associated at all with that team? Yes. What was his association with that team? He was my coach. And uh, prior to him coaching you at that event, how long had you known Michael Barrison? I met Michael in 2002. And in what capacity did you uh, first start interacting with Michael? I actually, um, I lived on his farm in 2002. I was working for Susan Blanks, who is an, another Olympian. Um, and she was in the process of going through the selection trials for the 2002 World Equestrian Games. I was her working student. We had horses at Michael's farm ahead of the selection trials. Your familiarity with Michael, uh, did it start in, in some capacity where he was training you? Not at that time. I didn't start training with Michael until 2010. Okay. But I lived on the farm, so I was there on and off that summer. Did you know Justin? Very well. When I got back, I went to Europe with Sue, and when I got back, Justin just started working for okay. Michael. So starting in 2010, that's when you began to train with Mr. Barrison? Yes. Uh, and uh, how long after that did you continue to train with him? Really through 2016. And then my top horse um, was injured in Rio and never came back. And I had a bunch of young horses, so... I would see Michael here and there, but I wasn't training like I was leading up to the Olympic Games. Um, <clears throat> did you also get to know Michael in any capacity other than as a trainer? Yes, uh, I would consider Michael a close friend. Um, in uh, August of 2019, uh, where were you physically located? I was actually driving back from a vacation with my family in the Keys. And uh, at that point in time, let's just bring it to August mm -hmm. of, of 2019, did you uh, receive a phone call from Jamie Dancer? I did. I'm not going to ask you to tell us what words were spoken in that call uh, because it will result in an objection. So the questions I'm asking you, please do not interpret that they that you need to respond in specific words. Understood. All right. So you spoke to Jamie Dancer that day. Yes. Do you recall approximately how long the phone conversation lasted? Um, I, it was a couple minutes because I was in the car with my family and I didn't want to have a discussion with them in the car. Uh, did you take any action as a result of your conversation with Miss Dancer? I did. As what did you do? As soon as we got home and I could separate myself privately, I called Michael. Did you have any particular concern that drove you to call Michael that day? Absolutely. What was your concern? Based on what Jamie had said to me and and texted me. Um, I was very concerned that Michael was going to kill himself. So you got Michael on the phone? Yes. Uh, without telling us what words were spoken, how was Michael when he first got on the phone? Well, he was quiet, which 
was very unlike Michael and started to tell me about... Objection, Judge. Try not to get into the words of the subject. Okay. So he was quiet at first. And then proceeded to get more upset and then was sobbing hysterically by the end of the phone call. Were you able to calm him down at all? No. In the past, had you viewed Michael in circumstances when he was upset? Yes, but nothing, nothing like this. You anticipated my next question. Based upon your years of knowledge and experience working with Michael and knowing him as a person, had you ever seen him in the state he was, or pardon, seems probably not the right word, had you ever encountered him in the state he was as of that phone call? No. So right now you are you have been listening to the testimony of Allison Braca, a former Olympian who coached with the defendant. We're going to continue our coverage right here on Court TV. You're not going to miss a thing. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nakhren in for Ted Rollins this morning. Uh, we continue.